Hi, good morning. Welcome to Reve at Home. My name's Karina and this is Derek and we're both part of the Dream Team here at Reve Church. If you are new, we're glad you're here. Please leave a comment below saying where you're from. We would love to give you a virtual high five. If you're looking for more ways to connect and grow with the people and mission of Red Bay Church, please visit us online where we have small groups for everyone. Also, if you haven't already, please follow us on Facebook and Instagram for daily encouragements and updates on how you can help serve our COVID-19 outreach. So now, let's jump right in.
In just a few minutes, we're going to receive our tithes and offerings. This is a time where we support the mission and vision of Red Bay Church. But before we do that, I want to show you something powerful that happens because of our generosity. Hey guys, Todd here. I'm here in Escondido and we are about to start an outreach and we've got about 120 cars uh, in line and today we're going to serve about 200 families, uh, giving them each a box of essential groceries today. We're literally feeding uh, families who are most impacted by this crisis, COVID-19. And uh, so I just want to tell you how grateful we are because of your generosity, uh, because of your giving uh, here at Reve Church. We are a part of a broader solution uh, here in serving our city, the city of San Diego, in practical ways. Uh, thank you so much for your faithfulness and giving, and we're making a difference uh, today here in Escondido. Love you guys. We'll see you soon. So there you have it. Because of your generosity, Red Bay Church is able to impact our city. There are two ways that you can give today. You can visit our website or you can text GIVE to the number on the screen. Thank you, Red Bay Church, for your generosity. Well, good to be with you today. My name is Todd. I serve as the pastor here at Rev A Church, a brand new faith community in the North County of San Diego. Welcome to Rev A at Home. We're so glad that you've joined us. Today, we're wrapping up a collection of talks called In All Things. And what we've been talking about is how God works in our greatest disappointments, failures, and shame. And today we're talking about failure. Now, I should tell you that there are adult themes that run throughout this collection of talks, and today's message is rated PG-13. And so you have been warned. But I'm so excited to share this message with you today because I get to share a part of my adoption story. So we all have failures uh, that are a part of our lives, that are a part of our past. Failure is unavoidable, right? But here's the question, how do we process failure? What I love about this message is we talk about this idea that failure is not final. And, and we all experience failure, but did you know that failure, failure is even a part of the extended family of Jesus? And we're gonna look at one of those stories today. So as we continue, let's jump right in. And so we've been looking at a verse, Romans 8, uh, and we got it on the screen here. And, and this is kind of the, the verse that sums it all up. Can you guys help me read this verse? Let's read it together. And we know that God causes... Now, hold on. So, so, so when we read the verse, we read it together and our lips move. And, and we say it out loud. So let's, let's read it again with passion. Let's, let's say it. And we know that God causes all things to work together for the good of those who love God. God causes the broken things in my life. He causes the dysfunctional things in my life, the messed up parts of my life, the good things, the bad things, and he, and he, and he, and he works his power and he works his grace and, and somehow brings good through it all. And so today as we, as we look at failure, I, I want to give you a thought, okay? So if you're taking notes, write this down. Here's the thought. Failure is not final in my life. Failure is not final in my life. With, with God, failure is not final in my life. Here's the reality. We're all going to face failure in our lives. It's just a part of the deal. It's a part of the equation. Okay, we, we're going to face failure. We're going to face big failure, small failure. We, we face failure in our past. We're going to face failure in our future. But here's the truth. Here's the truth. Failure is not final in my life. And we see that through the story of King David. Now, as we look at the, the story of David, failure is like the furthest word uh, from uh, from what we would define David as. David was actually one of the most successful people who ever lived. In his time, he was the man. I mean, he was the most successful man of his time. He was King David, but, but not only was he king, he was a shepherd, a very successful shepherd for a period of time. It's kind of an odd combination. You went, went for, from shepherd to king, okay? But, but you got to read the story. He made the jump, and, and he tran trans translated into the king of Israel, the second king of Israel. He had amassed over time 60,000 square miles of his kingdom that he ruled over solely, which was just extraordinary. He had amazing amounts of wealth. He had women. Did I mention that David was handsome? Okay, he, he had it all. He had it all. A little bit of a ladies' man, but, but, but we're going to talk about that in just a minute. But he had it all. 
Success was the name of the game for, for David. And year after year, he just gets more and more and more. And yet what's so intriguing about the story is that David was one of the most successful people who've ever lived. Most famous, powerful women, wealth. Uh, he had the looks. But he was also a man after God's own heart. The scripture calls him one of the most passionate men after God. He, he loved God. He loved God so much that he actually wrote. He, he, he was a musical composer. He, he, he composed musical ballads that actually became part of the scriptures that we know as the Psalms. He sang for God. He, he danced for God. He lived for God. He, he worshiped God with every fiber of his being. And yet even David experienced major moral failure in his life. It's so intriguing, right? I mean, how could someone be so committed to God and yet experience such a high degree of moral failure in their lives? It just kind of tells us. It doesn't matter if you're a woman of God, a man of God, a, a woman who pursues God with everything that you have, a, a man who's committed to God with every part of your life. None of us are exempt from moral failure. You could be a pastor, a professor, a, a, a commercial you know, banker. We're all we're all kind of in the same boat. We're not exempt from moral failure in our lives. And so as we pick up the story of David, what we see is we begin to see a, a moral decline. We begin to see a, a decline of, of David's character, of his integrity over time. So at this point, David has been king for about 20 years. He's about 50-something years old. And we see this decline in this first verse here. And it says this in 2 Samuel 5 and 12. It says, and David realized that the Lord had confirmed him as king over Israel and had blessed his kingdom for the sake of his pe people Israel. So what is the verse saying? It's just simply saying that David was the man and he had a cell phone that he needed to answer. No. <laughs> David was the man and he knew it. He was, the, you know, it's, it's, there's a difference, right? Because you, you can be the man. But if you know you're the man, that's the people that are just annoying, aren't they? I mean, you know a girl like that or a guy like that? That was David. He was the man and he knew it because God had confirmed him. He was successful. He was powerful. And, and then the story continues in verse 13. After moving from Hebron to Jerusalem, David married more concubines and wives. Again, a little bit of a ladies' man here. And so he's amassing not only wealth and power and, and fame, prestige and land, but he's gathering women as well, which is a big no-no for him as he was the king. You read it in Deuteronomy. He wasn't supposed to do this. And so we see this moral decline, a decline of David's character, his integrity is, is evaporating with every step of success. And then we see the story in 2 Samuel verse, uh, ch chapter 11 and verse 1. It says this, In the spring of the year when kings normally go to war, David went, sent Joab and the Israelite army to fight the Ammonites. They destroyed the Ammonite army and laid siege to the city of Rabbah. However, David stayed behind in Jerusalem. So what do we see here? We see that David was supposed to be working. David was supposed to be at war. And he wasn't. He stayed behind in Jerusalem. So he sent, it, sent his guys out to do his, his, his battle, his, his, his fighting for him, and, and he stays behind. So David is in a place that he should not be. How many of you know when, and you're, when you're in the wrong place at the wrong time, bad things tend to happen? Anybody have a story on that you'd like to share? No, we don't want to do that, right? But we do because when you're in the wrong place at the wrong time, bad things happen. And this is what happens in David's life late one afternoon after his midday rest. It must be tough being king, kind of taking naps and all, you know, just resting. And he gets up and David got out of bed and it was a really nice bed. It was like kind of a pillow top bed and, and he got out and he was walking on the roof of his palace, so he goes out of his quarters, and as he looked out over the city, he noticed a woman of unusual beauty taking a bath. Now, pretty obvious what's going on here, right? David is, is taking a little stroll. He's taking in the spring air, and he sees a woman. Now, the verse is very clear here. So when you read the Bible, you have to, you have to you know, take note of what the descriptive uh, qualities are, and, and the verse says that she was a woman of unusual beauty, Okay. Now, I don't think any woman is average, okay? Personally, I don't. But this verse is saying that she was an absolute knockout. This was like, you know, it, it, whatever your description of an unusual, beautifully woman is. I don't know what that is. But this was Bathsheba. 
And he had, all, but he had all these women. He had all these wives. He had all these concubines. But he walks out and he sees Bathsheba. She catches his eye. And then the story goes on. He sent someone to find out who she was. And he was told she is Bathsheba, the daughter of Iliam, and the wife of Uriah the Hittite. You know what the, the servant is saying here? The servant is warning David. The servant is literally saying, in, in, in the Hebrew translation, he, he's saying, dude, she's married. And by the way, she's married to Uriah. Now, Uriah was like one of David's boys, okay? He was one, one of David's mighty men. He was literally fighting David's battle as we speak in this very moment. So, so, so Uriah was like laying his life down for David. David was, was boys with Uriah, and, and the servant's like, dude, bro, She's married, and, and it's Uriah's wife. But, but David doesn't, doesn't heed the, the warning here. Then David sent messengers to get her, and when, he, when she came to the palace, he slept with her. Then she returned home. Later, when Bathsheba discovered that she was pregnant, she sent David a text saying, <laughs> sorry, a message uh, saying that I'm pregnant with the little sad emojis, you know, and I'm pregnant. So David's caught. He's busted. A one-night stand turns into something else that he wasn't expecting. She's pregnant, and, and so instead of repenting, instead of coming to God, coming clean, David uh, covers the situation up, and we see what happens here. And David sent word to Joab, send me Uriah the Hittite. So Joab sent him to David. And so David's like, okay, I'm going to cover this thing up. And so here's my plan. I'm going to get Uriah because I know Uriah has a really hot wife. And I think Uriah knows that he has a really hot wife. So here's the plan. I'm going to get Uriah to come home. And I'm going to say, hey, bro, fist bump. How you doing? How's the battle? How, how the, how's everything going? And, and hey, why don't you, you know, go spend some time with your wife? And if he spends time with his wife, you know, guess what? This whole thing might you know, might work out. The DNA testing wasn't quite, you know, there yet, back in the day. And so maybe that'll work. But we see that it doesn't here. But Uriah didn't go home. He slept that night at the palace entrance with the king's palace guard. So David is like face to face with a man of integrity, a man of character. Literally, Uriah says to David, I cannot go, I cannot go to my home. I cannot, how can I go to the comfort of my own home? How can I sleep in the arms of my wife when my men are out of battle? And a hair is floating on my thumb. <laughs> How can I do that? See, Uriah has, has so much character, so much integrity, and, and it might even be a, 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 a reminder to David of the shadow of what he was before. And yet over time, he's lost the war with character. He's lost the war with integrity, and so it's cover-up after cover-up after cover-up, and, and David goes to the extreme here. He says, well, stay here today, David told him, and tomorrow you may return to the army. So Uriah stayed in Jerusalem that day and the next. Then David invited him to dinner and got him drunk. Maybe a little, little, little alcohol involved here. We'll, we'll see what happens. But even then, he couldn't get Uriah to go home to his wife. Again, he slept at the palace entrance with the king's palace guard. Does not work. And so David literally takes the cover up to the next level here in this last verse. So the next morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and gave it to Uriah to deliver. The letter instructed Joab, station Uriah on the front lines where the battle is fiercest. Then pull back so that he will be killed. Literally, David writes Uriah's death sentence and gives it to him to deliver to his commander-in-chief. It's an amazing, amazing conspiracy for murder. And so if David were here this morning... I believe he would ask us three questions. If he were here, he would pose questions to us and, and, and help us address the, the failures in our lives, the moral failures in our lives. Because here, here's the reality. None of us are exempt. I'm not exempt. You're not exempt. If David, I mean, a man after God's own heart, a man who, who wrote parts of the Bible can fall in this way, we can all fall. But I believe he would ask us three questions. And the first is this. Do you have an open window? Do you have an open window? Everybody say uh, with me on the count of three, open window. One, two, three. Open window. open window. Do you have an open window? Look at this verse here. 
in John 10, 10, it says this, the thief's purpose is to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus here is talking about your spiritual enemy. He's saying, by the way, you have a spiritual enemy, and he d- he's describing your spiritual enemy as a thief. Isn't that interesting? And he says that, that the, the, the number one purpose, the number one goal and, and, and mission of your spiritual enemy's life is to steal from you, destroy you, and kill you. In fact, he wants to steal everything that is good in your life. He wants to steal your marriage. He wants to steal from your kids. He wants to steal from your future. He wants to steal from your purity. He wants to steal from your thoughts. Every, in every possible way imaginable, he wants to steal everything that is good. And yet we see, on the other hand, God, in Romans 8, 28, this, the verse that the series is based on, and we know that God causes all things to work together for the good of those who love God. Have you ever wondered, what is God up to in my life? Like, have you ever asked yourself that question? Like, you're facing a situation, maybe it's a disappointment, maybe it's a letdown, maybe you're going through a season of life that you're facing that you, you don't know how you're going to get through and you don't understand what God is doing. Have you ever asked the question, what is God up to in my life? You know the answer to that? God is always up to good in your life. God always has been up to good in your life. God always will be up to God, good in your life. Now, God is not a, a, a genie in a bottle, okay? God's purpose in life isn't to make us happy. He's making us holy. But through that process, he is ultimately bringing good into our life. He's even trying to transform and recycle the bad in our lives into good. So we have this epic battle. We have this epic conflict going on. Do you see it? And we see it all over in the world. I mean, you can't open up your smartphone and, and, and read the news. There's a, there's a shooting. There's a bombing. There's, a, there's, a, there's some kind of racial injustice happening in the world. We're like, what's going on? Well, what's, what's the root of the issue? The root of the issue is that we have a spiritual enemy. He's not just coming after people who love Jesus. He's coming after all of humanity. And the only thing he wants to do in our lives is he wants to steal from you. Now, it, 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 it is worth noting here. If we look at David and Bathsheba, okay, let's just call it what it is, okay? David and Bathsheba, nowhere in the scriptures does it say he forced himself on her, okay? Bathsheba was a willing participant, all right? And by the way, why was she bathing naked outside anyway? When she knew people could see her. Okay, Bathsheba a, has a part to play in this whole, in this whole thing. But, but we have to, you can't skim over this. David and Bathsheba had a great time that night. Can we, I mean, I know this is church, but can we, can we say that? Can I say that? I mean, they had a great time. Okay, like, like it, I mean, it was wild. It was sexy. I mean, it was, it was stolen, you know, like, it, 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 was just a, it was just a moment in time night that was just unforgettable. Right? I mean, and, and, and like, like, if you're not having fun when you sin, you're doing it wrong. Like, <laughs> you know, like, sin is fun. You know, sin is, like, if anybody tells you, like, if you go to a church and they say sin's not fun, they're lying to you. Sin is fun. It's a blast in the moment. Oh, my goodness. Could you imagine? Don't imagine David and Bathsheba. But, but it's fun. The forbidden fruit, it was wild. It was erotic, and yet in the moment, David and Bathsheba, they didn't know they were being stolen from. There was a thief at the door. There was a thief outside that was trying to get in and steal everything from them. I love this quote. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, an author, he says this, in our moment of temptation, God becomes unreal to us. How true is that? You see, it doesn't matter if you're, if you're a man of God, a woman of God, you, you pursue God, you love God, you worship God, you celebrate God in every possible way. In your moment of temptation, God becomes absolutely unreal to you. In their moment of temptation, in David's moment of temptation, God was a million miles away from him. And the consequences of his sin was a million miles away. And so he, had, he, had, he, had, he enjoyed the moment, but he didn't realize the thief was coming in to steal everything, trying to steal everything from him. The, s- the second question David would ask us this morning uh, is, is, do you have a Nathan? Do you have a Nathan? Now, this is a very interesting story because David at this point 
where Nathan comes in is, is about eight months past the situation, that, the, the affair with Bathsheba, uh, about eight months past the, the, the death of Uriah, the murder of Uriah, and, and the whole cover-up has, has kind of taken place, and David moves on with his life. And then one day at the palace, David gets a visitor, and his name is Nathan. Now, Nathan is a very intriguing character, okay, because Nathan was not below David, okay? So King David, I mean, everyone else was below D David, but Nathan was more of an equal. And David gave Nathan free reign to speak into his life. We see this over and over throughout their story. And so Nathan comes over and he's like, hey, David, can I tell you a story? And David's like, sure, tell me the story. And Nathan says, okay, so one day there was a rich man and a poor man, and they lived right next to each other. And the rich man had wealth beyond measure, and the poor man had nothing but a little lamb. And, and he loved that, that poor man loved that little lamb. It was a cute little lamb. It was kind of small and cuddly and, and it furry. It had these little curly locks and, and it made noises like, meh, you know. But not, not too much, not too much. It wasn't too loud. It was like the perfect little lamb. And at night, he would feed, this man would feed the, the lamb from his plate. He would let the lamb drink from his cup. And at night, he would cuddle with that little lamb. He thought of that lamb as a, as a daughter. He loved that little lamb as one of his kids. And, and then one day, the rich man, he has friends over. And so the rich man, instead of killing a lamb from his own flock and giving it to his friends, he, he steals the poor man's lamb and kills it and serves it to his company. And David, as soon as he hears this, he gets up and he's so furious. He says, that man must die. That man must pay back multiple times what he has stolen, and that man must die. And in this epic response, Nathan looks back at David and says, that man is you. That man is you, David. And as soon as Nathan says this, David melts. He falls to the ground. He's on his knees. He repents to God. He knows exactly what Nathan is talking about. He's, Nathan's talking about him. He says, God, would you forgive me for what I've done? For, forgive me of the cover-up. Forgive me of the sin. Forgive me for not coming to you sooner, sooner and first. And it's this beautiful moment. It's this, it's this huge turning point in David's life. And what's so interesting about this part of the story uh, is that David really did deserve to die. You know, he was a king, and he had an affair with Bathsheba. He committed murder or conspired to, to commit murder. And then he tried to cover the whole thing up. David deserved to die. And yet because he had a Nathan, Nathan unloads the consequences for him. Because anytime you sin, especially in an affair, there's major, major consequences. And so, so Nathan unfolds the, the consequences for David, but he spares his life. See, David was spared because he had a friend like Nathan. A friend that was, was, uh, had free reign to speak into his life, to ask him anything. And to call him out on anything. I've shared this story before, but I grew up, and as a teenager, I was exposed to pornography. And, and throughout my entire teenage years, I was pretty much addicted to, to pornography. And then I had this radical conversion experience with God. I, I gave my life to Jesus, to follow Jesus, at 19 years old. And so at, at that time, in that season of my life, I knew that I had an open window in my life. That had to be intentional about shutting. And, and so I've been, I've been intentional about finding Nathans in my life, specifically uh, throughout my uh, entire life. To this very day, I have a Nathan who, who has free reign to say anything they want to me, to ask me anything, to call me out, to call me up. He asked me uh, once a quarter, he says, Todd, have you looked at pornography? And I've given him permission. You see, here's the thing. When we have Nathans in our lives, when we have a Nathan, a Nathan is the grace of God working in our lives. A Nathan will save us in ways that we can't even possibly fathom. Let me ask you this morning. Do you have a Nathan? Do you have someone that you've given that permission to, to call you out, to call you up? The third question that David would ask us is, do we choose repentance daily? Do you choose Repentance daily. Repentance is, is such an old school wor word, isn't it? 
Does anybody like the word repentance? Anybody? Nobody. Wow, it's great. I was expecting like one hand, you know? No, we don't like repentance, right? It's, it's so old school, but it's so clutch. You want the grace of God working in your life. You want, you want your, your life to move to the highest level, to reach your fullest potential that you can. And we have to choose repentance daily. The chapter I'm going to share with you, the passage, is Psalm 32. And, and most believe that this was written immediately in the moment when, when Nathan walked out of the room and closed the door. As soon as he had rebuked David, spoken into David's life, and gave him the consequences of what was going to happen. Most believe that David was on the floor, and, and in, this, in this moment, he, he wrote this psalm. And let's read it together. Oh, what joy for those whose disobedience is forgiven, whose sin is put out of sight. Yes, what joy for those whose record the Lord has cleared of guilt, whose lives are lived in complete honesty. Finally, I've confessed all my sins to you and stopped trying to hide my guilt. I said to myself, I will confess my rebellion to the Lord, and you forgave me. All my guilt is gone. What a beautiful, beautiful moment. It's repentance. You see, in repentance, we can go through any moral failure, and, and God can save us through it. It doesn't free us from consequences. David's son from the affair died. Nathan told David that the sword will never leave your house to the day you die. David faced some major, major consequences. But we see this beautiful moment here when, when David repents. And, and you know what repentance is? Repentance is simply keeping short accounts with God. And, you know, it's like, you know, from the point that you're convicted of a sin in, in your life to the point that you repent of that sin in your life, the shorter and shorter and the, and the, and the smaller that, that gap gets, the more spiritually mature you're becoming. You see, repentance is all about keeping short accounts with God. Here are the questions. Here are the questions. David would ask us, on the other side of failure, to help us with our own failures. He would say, do you, do you have a Nathan? Do you have a window open? And do you choose repentance daily? You see, the, answering these questions for ourselves and wrestling through these questions ourselves is not only going to help us get through moral failure in our own, own lives, it's going to help us avoid moral failure in the future. You see, failure is not final in our lives when God's involved. And I want to share a story of that with you. Uh, today, I have the extreme pri privilege of, of sharing my dad's story with you. And unlike David, he did not commit adultery, uh, but he did experience failure. Let's watch this as we continue. In looking back at my life, there are many things that I'm really not very proud of. There are many things that I think I've failed at. And certainly my marriage is one of those. When I think back about our ups and downs, I don't think they were that uncommon for many other married family. Sometimes there are some major issues that come up. I know we both worked at it. We both made mistakes. Sometimes you just don't want to let go of some of the things involved, and when that happens, it's, uh, it, it kind of drives a wedge. The wedge gets bigger. This situation we were faced with is something that we had worked at for a number of years. We had counseling from professionals and counseling from church leadership. But we just couldn't find a way that was something that we could work at. So in the end, we backed up and said, let's, let's see if we can't separate and do the best we can for our children. When I say that the word failure, I, I'm, certainly it was a failure. It was something that you really want to try to hide. Uh, it was a dark spot that you couldn't get around. We didn't feel equal to those around us, those families that were continuing on with their marriage. You didn't want to talk to anybody. You didn't want to, you, you didn't have anything in common to talk about anymore. 
it was something that he wanted to hide. So we were really in kind of a really a dark hole. We were separated from others that were succeeding. Today it's something that happens. I believe that a lot of times it can be avoided. And it's allowed me, from my experience, to be able to talk to people. There are many things I wish I could have done better. But on the other hand, I can also say, did you begin to know that Jesus died for our sins and our mistakes? Mine too. I can go ahead and know that Jesus loves me just as much. So I strive to look forward. I take my failures in the past, I give them to my Lord Jesus Christ, and I ask Him to bless me going forward. Failure is not final. I love that quote. I want to leave you with one more quote as we come to a close today, and that there is a future beyond our failure. Failure does not define me, uh, failure is a moment in time, but there's a future beyond my failure because of Jesus. In fact, I would tell you this, that the future is full of hope because of Jesus. It's amazing. And this is a beautiful transition right now uh, into communion today because we're going to celebrate uh, in just a moment with the elements. Now, you may want to pause this uh, right now and go get your elements and Bring them uh, for your family and for yourself. And on the night that Jesus was betrayed, uh, he took the bread and he broke it. He presented it to his disciples and he told them, every time you take this bread, I want you to remember my body that would be broken for you. Then he took the cup and, and he presented the juice to his, to his friends. And he said, every time you take this juice, I want you to remember my blood that was shed for you. In, in essence, what Jesus was doing as he was, for once and for all, he was letting us know that failure is not final in our lives, that we're not defined by our worst moments. Because of Jesus, the future is full of hope today. Hey, let's celebrate communion together. All right, so this week we pray that God blesses you in your labor. We pray that God blesses you in your leisure. And just wanna speak Ephesians 320 over your life and now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we could ever ask or imagine according to his power that's at work within you to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever amen God bless you guys we hope to see you soon <laughs>